Hello everyone and welcome to this little channel we created here. Now the reason we did it is because we want to create a space where we can facilitate discussion, where we can invite uh, experts, activists, politicians and to talk about the kind of world we're building right now and also about the things that we could potentially do better. So this is a uh, pilot episode, uh, it's on the future of education, education globally, education here in Canada specifically and a little bit about Finland too. So we would love to hear your feedback, please tell us what you think about this kind of format would you like to see more of this kind of videos and uh, also everyone's contacts are in the description and I hope you enjoy it. All right hello everyone and welcome to today's panel. Um, I'd like to start with acknowledging that we are currently on the dish with one spoon territory and I believe that if we want to build a better world in Canada then we cannot do it without them. So with that. Um, the title of today's panel is The Future of Education, and I'd like to start it uh, with telling you a story, a story of myself and friends of mine from my undergrad. Hey, my name is Alexei, and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Toronto, and before I moved to Canada, I actually did my undergrad in Finland. Uh, it's a lovely country, northern Europe. Uh, it's sort of like Canada, but tiny. And um, spoiler alert, I did my undergrad there for free. Uh, so yeah, there might be a little bit of crazy Marxist nonsense in what I'm talking about, but I promise you'll have my mouth washed with soap after we are done, so that's fine. I remember one time I was in a bar talking to a Finnish guy I just randomly met, and um, he was my age, asking what he studies, and he told me that he's not in university, he's a truck driver, and he didn't want to go to university in the first place because he just loves driving his truck. And he knows that his children will get free education and essentially free healthcare too. So he can just keep doing what he wants. I mean, he pays high taxes, yes, but he also loves it because, well, why wouldn't you want to invest part of your income into building a healthy society around you for, for yourself, for your children and everyone else? So there is that. And uh, the town where I did my undergrad was called Mikkeli. It was a small town of 34,000 people, which was also actually a capital of the region because, well, as I said, Finland is like Canada, but tiny. So, and the university where I did my undergrad was at that time called Mikkeli University of Applied Sciences. It didn't have fantastic funding or world-leading profs, but um, actually as I was preparing for this talk, I was trying to find its world university ranking and I wasn't sure I can do it, but I did find it. It's, 10,851. So some of you might be asking yourself some reasonable questions like what the hell he is doing here, but that's fine. Uh, that's the, where the story gets interesting. Because although there was no crazy funding there, something people understood there was that the internet could potentially give you much more information than any individual prof could. It's like you, you might have had a situation during your studies, for example, uh, when you asked, uh, teacher a question and they don't know the answer because it happens, we, we, no one knows everything. And what profs do right now often, they would go online and just Google it. And some students get confused, they're like, well, why is my prof Googling something? But that's actually a reasonable thing to do. The trick here is that the profs, they are capable of telling a reliable source of information from unreliable. So other benefits of using the internet would be, for example, uh, there are much more courses available there than any university can provide. Basically, whatever you're interested in, there is something about it online. Also, you can find uh, educational sources that would, for example, take a very complicated abstract concept that you're struggling with and visualize it so intuitively you, you wonder how come you never understood it before. And there is so much more. Basically, whatever your learning pattern is, there is something for you there. And let me say this. Do I think that mandating online courses is a good idea? Definitely not. Online education is a skill. You can teach it to someone, and if your student has the skill, then you definitely should encourage them to use it. But if somebody cannot do it, you cannot force them to take online courses. So, in a system like that, basically the role of the teacher change, teacher, the role of the teacher changes. The teacher is not really like a map anymore that takes you from where you are towards your degree. They're not telling you like take this, this and that and then you become something. Instead, teacher is more of a compass. They help you find yourself through teaching you how to navigate the information space. And in a system like that, basically the whole concept of education gets reduced to two basic 
learning skills, the ability of students to search for information and the ability to validate it. Like, as I said, the prof who is Googling an answer, they know how to tell a reliable source of information. They would check, for example, whether it cites something and what it cites and so on. So what Finnish education focused on is teaching us these two skills. And that felt mind-blowing because we were free to change our curriculum in whatever way we wanted. We, um, so like for example, I started as an environmental engineer and ended up doing machine learning because I felt like it. And also the exams there weren't hard at all, which might be shocking for some people here. Um, also, student mental health wasn't an issue either. I don't remember a single student killing themselves because of their studies. And it was even possible to put online courses on your transcript. Not only courses, even uh, competitions. Like I had a team that did well in one of the hackathons and we spent many hours working on it. So I asked the prof who was the head of my program if it's okay to put it on my transcript. And she said, yeah, I can see why not. So I got a couple of credits for that, which was amazing. And it is so important to give students these opportunities and to lower the levels of stress and anxiety because the way many education systems are still designed right now uh, suffer from several issues. For example, the world is becoming even, even more specialized these days. It's so hard to choose what you want to do with your life, and especially this idea of choosing one thing and just sticking with it for the rest of your life doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, multiply that by lack of time to try different things, and it becomes really hard to find your authentic work and identity, something that would make you feel fulfilled and excited. And this is what Finnish education focused on. All right, well, that all sounds nice and happy, hippie, but how about the real world? How about, how do the students get employed then if you let them choose whatever they want to do? Well, that in Finland was achieved through countless hackathons, competitions, exchange programs. Basically, we were provided with opportunities to do anything you can imagine. And this works very simple. So you provide students with abundance of opportunities. And companies often would, for example, sponsor an event, like sponsor a competition, because they have some problem they're trying to solve. So they just invite students to try to solve it. And students naturally uh, choose those things that they're just more interested in uh, out of this whole pool of opportunities. And uh, if you do well, then it goes on your CV. So basically, everyone's CV is a reflection of their interests and their skills. This is what happened there. And this way, uh, I ended up at UFT, and I love it here. I have friends who are working in world's top companies like Microsoft and Cisco, and some are learning to become landscape designers just because they felt they want to do it. Um, so that was great. And well, what about... What about Canada then? And the thing is, in Canada, there are already s many organizations that are advocating for this kind of education system. For example, we have a STEM fellowship, which is uh, mostly a student-run organization, a federal nonprofit organization that's aiming at equipping the next generation of uh, digital citizens with the skills they would need to succeed in new digital economy. And there is one initiative going on right now, uh, which is an undergraduate big data challenge uh, this year on recreational drugs, very relevant in Canada right now. Uh, and um, in addition to that, we have student organizations that are advocating for free education too. For example, there is a with a students campaign by the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario, which is calling on the provincial government to, first of all, eliminate tuition for all students, that's including international students too, um, to provide students with non-repayable grants as opposed to loans, so they don't have to, they don't have to go in debt if they want to get education. Uh, they asking the government to increase public funding for public education, which makes logical sense. And of course, uh, asking to protect all independent student voices and our right to organize, which are the ways that student organizations, students' unions can hold the government accountable. So, all this brings us to the current disposition, the current state in which the world is, which is uh, the progress is fast. It's very fast. Sometimes it happens that the techniques students learn in the beginning of their studies right now become obsolete by the time they graduate. It requires different level of adaptability for students. Also, we don't stop learning after we graduate anyway. So uh, what you want, you want to teach students how to learn. Also, there are good examples of countries that are focused on the education systems having this 21st century uh, realities in mind, for example, Finland. And we could probably learn a lot from them. And uh, 
of course, there are student unions, there are organizations already in Canada that are advocating for this kind of system. So this brings us to the three questions I wanted to discuss today. What do you think is the future of education? Uh, how do you think we can improve education system in Canada? And whether you think education should be free? So with that, I would like to invite our speakers uh, to join me at these beautiful chairs. So we have Chris Glover, um, NDP uh, representative at the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. Uh, is this right? Uh, we have uh, Sandhya, uh, a PhD student and CHR fellow here at University of Toronto, and we have Sasha, executive director at STEM Fellowship. So, welcome. So, what is the future of education? Sandhya, would you like to start? Yes. Thank you. Um, so yes, thanks for the question. Um, when I think about the future of education in Canada, there's a couple things that come to mind for me in particular, and that's the evolving nature of technology, which is very exciting because that could mean that there's a lot more jobs out there um, and lots of other opportunities that are becoming available that weren't available before. Um, but also the job market itself can be problematic. Uh, we know that not everyone is getting jobs right away after graduation, and it doesn't necessarily mean that this is education and how it's being done in Canada is the only thing that is um, potentially an issue that can be improved for the job market, but it could be potentially one thing. So when I'm thinking about that, there are two main things that come to mind, um, and that's diversifying our skills as students um, and expanding how we teach and how we learn. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned hackathons. That was something that came to mind for me as well. I come from more of a life sciences background, and so things like skills in the computer sciences or engineering and things like this aren't necessarily areas that have traditionally been seen as important for somebody like me to have going in through the university experience. But I was able to participate in one myself, and I didn't have a background in computer science or anything like that. But I actually find that to be a, an amazing experience where I brought kind of my experience coming from the life sciences background and helped to integrate that with the background of the other students who were there. And we had a great learning experience learning from each other. So I now like started to learn to code and do all these other things. And I found that I have now a little bit more experience in 3D printing and things like that. But also learning to work with the teams in a more real world experience where we're actually trying to solve more real world problems, which I think is such a, uh, an amazing experience to have as a student that adds to the academic experience that we already have. Um, and the second thing that comes to mind is expanding, as I mentioned, how we teach and learn. So um, the, the inverted classroom approach um, is something that is becoming more and more popular. So um, for example, we could do things like lectures and things on students' own time and using the actual classroom time to learn in more collaborative ways and using technology to do that. The last thing I'll just mention for now is competency-based learning, um, which is another thing that the uh, Higher Education Qu uh, Quality Council of Ontario has really been focusing on itself, which kind of looks more at moving away from credentials again and more towards competen competencies um, that are based on skills and things that students can be bringing to employers, um, but also looking at the ways we assess um, student work. So not necessarily rote memorization, but moving towards ways of assessing um, performance skills and things like that, um, that will be more um, clearly showing an evidence of being able to have these skills and, and perform in a, a job market. Chris, do you have something to add here? Um, thank you so much. So I'd say there's two uh, different poles in the future of education. The first one is that there are right-wing governments, like the one we have in Ontario and right-wing governments oh, in many yeah. other countries, um, that are, are trying to make a post-secondary education a uh, market commodity. And they're trying to put up fences of, you know, huge barriers of, of cost and student debt that make it uh, only limited, uh, limited availability to particular students, and mainly, and a lot of that is based on cost. A lot of it is your family income. Um, and we've seen that in Ontario. The tuition fees have been skyrocketing for the last 20 years, and, and students in Ontario, they have the lowest per capita funding from their, from their provincial government. They have the highest tuition fees. They have the highest student debt. And so there, it's become a market commodity. It used to be a public good. It used to be a public service. Uh, I'm 
in my 50s now, when I was uh, a student at this very college here, at Innes College at U of T, um, tuition fees were about $1,000 a year. And that was across the board. That was for every program, uh, whether you're in medical school or engineering or undergrad, whatever it was, it was about $1,000 a year, which in today's dollars would be about $2,500. Um, so I think the right-wing poll to make it a market commodity, an exclusive uh, market commodity, uh, is one poll. I think the other poll, though, is disruption and, you know, the technological disruption. And I'm not sure what avenue or what road that's going to take, but, you know, Harvard University has most of the courses online. Uh, lots more courses are, are coming online. I'm interested about your experience, to learn more about your experience in Finland. Um, you know, and, and what, what can you teach students and what can students learn through online learning? And what do you actually need a professor for? Um, and, and if I can pose a question uh, to you based on your experience. So when I was teaching at York University, I was teaching a course for the last 10 years on the history and economics of Ontario, of our province. And within that, I always taught students about logical analysis and creating a logical argument. And so what every article that we read in the course, they had to break it down into premises and conclusions, and then we would do a logical analysis to, to test the validity of the argument that was made. And then when they were writing essays, they had to make a logical argument back. Like they had to you know, prove what they were saying. They had to you know, back up anything, any point that they were making. And for me, that was something that I don't think students could have learned online. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a particular skill. And so I'm wondering about, you know, the, the program that you were in in Finland, that kind of skill set, do you need a professor to teach you that? Or was there a way to learn it, you know, through online learning? That's a good question. Hmm. Well, in general, I want to say this. I, I don't think you can teach everything online. Also, I don't think you can always let students choose entirely their curriculum. For example, if we take medical students, for example, then we can't really afford having doctors who chose themselves what to study and what not, right? But in areas such as engineering, science, arts, I think we could do more of that. So, um, I, 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 can, I think I can imagine an online course where some of the tasks that are given to students would be to do the kind of analysis you're talking about. So um, I think it, it's possible, but maybe that would require some sort of online courses uh, that are designed with more interaction. For example, uh, to um, pair students with each other so they can have conversations. So if, let's say you have thousands of students taking a course, if you randomly select them in groups so they can talk, maybe that would help. I guess, Sasha, you want to add something to this? I actually, uh, it, it is a fascinating topic. Uh, there is no better topic for me. It is simply um, honey for my ears. Um, but I would like to ask you, uh, is it really a question of online, uh, putting a curriculum online? I see a bit different trend happening. We have a cognitive automation, which became uh, practically prevalent. And it is um, not only a norm now in industry. It is practically a norm of life for the whole young generation, uh, grammarly. It is uh, practically a tool with which I am finding students, uh, uh, without exception, writing now the essays. And it's also even adults. And what is Grammarly? It is um, artificial intelligence which is assisting you. Uh, so it is not really a question of taking the courses online, which is still teaching the old way. Uh, I was trying to understand how um, I am teaching and how uh, my profs were teaching me. We are trying to replicate practically the pedagogy we were taught. It was, uh, we are trying to make, uh, well, take the best and pass it on. But what had happened, I believe, with this generation of students overall, it is a different way of learning. There is a term of uh, learning style. Uh, we were familiar with learning style, audio, visual. Now uh, there is a crowdsourcing of knowledge as a learning style. When I'm looking how students work with Reddit, I see uh, 
a student paying um, a role of instructor this particular second, and the next second he is a learner, and the following second he is the cooperator. Uh, Quera, uh, you wouldn't find uh, probably um, anywhere else uh, the top-notch uh, scientists uh, finding time simply to answer questions of community, community learning. So. I would rather think that the future of education is not in replication of uh, MIT and uh, big names all put their curriculum online, and it is great. It is open science, it is open education. But they are still teaching us manual math. They are still teaching us manual physics. And it doesn't exist the moment we get out of the classroom. The moment we are out of the classroom, it uh, look at the uh, any of the job um, posting. These two, that two, and another two. So practically, everything what is expected of the person, it is ability to use cognitive automation tools. Can I ask a question here? Because one of the things that I've been wrestling with for the last few years is that you know, a lot of, line, a lot of learning is happening online, and everybody's working online. And the, the irony is that uh, people are actually working closer together. They need, so I don't understand, and I'm, I'm, my question, I guess, really is, like, what is, the, with disrupted learning, what is the relationship between what you actually learn online versus what you do face-to-face? -face? Because, like, I finished a PhD thesis last year. Most of that thesis I wrote in a coffee shop you know, with a whole bunch of other people. And the coffee shop was always packed with people, you know, and you'd, you'd sit there, that would be your workplace, and you'd go and you'd, you know, stop and have a conversation with the person across the table, and sometimes there would be some collaboration on it, and, and then you'd go back to your work. And the innovation centers that are in our colleges and universities, same sort of thing, like people pay $300 or whatever it is for a desk at one of these innovation centers or in a shared workspace. And so even though they're working mostly online, they also need the face-to-face -face and that collaboration. And that's one of the interesting things about disrupted learning. And, you know, and it's really relevant, a relevant question to our institutions. What is the relationship between what we do face-to-face -face and what we do online? Because it just seems there's this natural evolution of spending more time in closer quarters than what we used to in a, in a regular workspace, um, even though we've got everything available to us online. There is interesting thing happens, um, and uh, it's probably different trends uh, affecting. Uh, practically, the turn of the century was the um, kind of uh, a dividing point, uh, and it's not the century was a dividing point. It was um, a common place of the high-speed internet, which became a household appliance. And it turned um, students and turned kids into different kind of learners. Some of them can comply with the traditional and the uh, still. Some, some of them will find um, what, we, um, what we need and this close cooperation. They find this close cooperation. They don't see the boundaries. They would have their friendships without geographic um, uh, considerations at all. And they would have very close and personal connections. I'm not talking about Facebook or a, a, any kind of this uh, social network, um, but actually uh, intellectual connections. So they will have emotional connections virtually. Because what is interesting, uh, and this is my impression, and I would uh, be happy to hear your opinion, what I believe this generation gets more life experience through virtual sources than through the f uh, f uh, real world or physical world. And they don't make really any distinction now which source is trustworthy or not. And Let's ask a young person. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really, really good point. I actually wanted to pick up on the idea of the collaborative teaching thing first, quickly, which was um, very interesting in, in, to me in that 
students can and take on the role of being the teacher but in one situation, but then go back to taking on the role of a learner and kind of sharing that kind of responsibility of teaching and learning together. And in terms of connecting and using technology to kind of gain the opportunities to, to learn in different ways. So for example, one of the things that came to mind to me when you were mentioning that was um, connecting outer space to our learning spaces here. So David St. Jacques being in on the uh, International Space Station right now, being able to connect to students and I guess most of this has been done in a lower than post-secondary situation, but can be in a post-secondary situation as well. Um, learning about, directly from somebody who is in space, learning about the things that are going on in that area. And then how do we connect that to the learning that we're doing here? Um, in terms of what is true and not in, in the things that we're learning. Um, and I think with the digital, access that we have these days, it, it does open up what we're accessing and what we're learning and the things that we can see to a degree that didn't exist in that way before. And that's something I think is an important th thing to keep in mind because yes, we have so much more access to things in terms of what we can learn from, but how do we kind of mediate that in terms of what's true, what's not true, what's a good source, what's not a good source. And I think it's very important to have that type of literacy and, and to teach media literacy to students. That's a massive, uh, of, of massive importance at this Can point. I, so I've got one question to pick up on what Sashin was saying there. So as young people, do you feel that you have emotional connections with your friends online that's similar to the friends in, in real life? Uh, I think I think boundaries stop existing when you're a young person who is using social networks. You know, it's like you, you realize that everyone everywhere in the world, regardless of where they are, they're just trying to find a way of living a fulfilled life. You know, uh, and this is something young people of our generation, I think, feel better just because we have this kind of, you know, online sharing experience. So... One thing doesn't substitute another. It is simply a new conglomerate. It's a new blend. And following on your um, one uh, additional kind of, uh, um, well, uh, additional thing which uh, technology brings, it is the effect of teaching. So one teacher who is currently in, uh, on the space station is teaching thousands of students, which was previously impossible. He's making direct connection, they see him present, and they feel his presence. Well, that is... Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely amazing. So as a, as a student, you can see, like for myself, if that was something that was happening when I was, I was in elementary school, um, one of my interests is potentially becoming an astronaut, and that would have been amazing to see an astronaut like in front of you, even though you are, can't like physically see them and and talk to them and, and see what's happening in that kind of situation. So it's you know technology is bridging those gaps and making so many things possible that weren't possible before. So I think that's quite amazing. Um, but to answer your question as well. Um, I agree that, that it, one does not replace the other in terms of face-to-face -face interaction and having interaction digitally. Um, it's something that has um, kind of, and I agree with you as well, Alexi, in that, in that like you can now connect with people across the world and kind of try to kind of join their experience and they can join your experience and, and what your life is like, what their life is like. Um, but then I personally am very much of a face-to-face -face person as well. I, that's very, very important to me. And I use kind of Instagram as well as more of a professional thing too. So I'm uh, one of the things that I do with my sister actually is science communication and outreach. So our we have a joint Instagram account where we um, are science communicators sharing our journeys in science together with all of our followers and kind of learning from others as well. And do you have an emotional connection through online connections or is it completely different? Is that the difference with face to face? Um, I think there's a different emotional connection that you have online versus face-to-face, -face, or at least for me, um, because I'm using some of these online things more in, at least Instagram, more in a professional way. It's a different connection, but I have friends on there as well. And it's kind of a nice way to keep up with people that you've met, but then you don't get to see because they're living in different places. And I think that is one of the key things. You're creating that emotional connection and keeping that emotional connection with someone that you can't see on a regular basis in person. 
Um, and that's kind of a neat thing from that as well. I would say there are probably different ways to use the same social network. So you could uh, have more personal account where you share things that literally happen all the time with you. And I have friends that like would post on Instagram stories almost anything that happens to them. So it's very close. And then we have more professional accounts that would share some events and like the thoughts on some subjects and so on. Thinking about this, so if you, when I, I was a high school teacher and the high school was designed in a quadrangle and the geography department was here and the history department was there and then the English department, the ESL department, like, and it really felt that I'm from Oshawa, which is General Motors City. And so I've worked on the line in, in the factory and it really felt like the factory is like you go into this, you know, to the geography department, you get the geography part of your brain installed and then you go to the history department, you get the history part of your brain installed. And so I realized, you know, like I agree with what you're saying that the system that we've got, uh, you know, is, is preventing us from moving forward. It's preventing us from, you know, really realizing the potential of education today. And part of it is not just the design of the building, but the training of us as teachers. Because I can teach ESL and English up to, you know, any, any level in high school. And I can teach a couple of other subjects up to grade 10. But other than that, I can't. So when we get into a problem-solving, you know, methodology, I can contribute to students, you know, in some areas, but I would need another teacher to come in and contribute. Like if we're going to be doing calculus, I would need another teacher to come in, like if that problem that they need. So it's how do you, how do you actually design a school and retrain teachers or, or design a methodology of, of learning so that everybody can contribute, but in different ways. I think there's been some really important points that have been made, and I think it's going to take a, a sort of a culture change to kind of get where we're talking about, which is, um, Potentially slow, but hopefully not that slow. Um, I also think that it's important to have uh, evidence-based type change. So evaluation of the ways the current system is working, which is being done by certain organizations, um, but also on the types of things that we're suggesting would be important to see how they work for people going into the workforce. Um, and I think just to add another kind of new topic back on that kind of ties back to how you started this event in the first place. Um, is to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and other things and looking at the recommendations that are being made and how do we make sure that we're incorporating those and addressing those in ways that it takes into account the stakeholders in question in particular. Well, thank you, folks. I, I love today's discussion. We discussed the ideal that we want to reach and some certain things that we can do to get there. And each one of you is very active in your own field, so I hope this conversation will help you get some ideas and you know, implement something in your areas, and Chris, in your particularly, since you're at the front line. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I also want to thank anyone, everyone who helped me organize it. I want to thank Fraser, uh, Joel, and Louisa for making this event possible. And um, if anybody uh, watched till the end uh, the, our resulting video, then thank you a lot. And uh, we really want some feedback to make this better. So this is basically a pilot. We want to have more of this kind of conversations where we present ideas and we have experts discussing them. So we want to have your feedback. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, see you next time, I guess. Thank you so much for having thank us. You. Thank you.